Now, we didn't really get into Unit 731, um, which is important. It is a covert, like I said, it's a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit in the Imperial Japanese Army that engaged in Mengele-style experimentation, engaged in lethal human experimentation and biological weapons manufacturing during the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II. And it was based in Pingfang District of Harbin, the largest city in the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo, now known as Northeast China, and had active branch offices throughout China and Southeast Asia. Okay. World War II saw extensive cruelty in every shape and every form. The Holocaust may stand as one of the most disturbing events in history, but the conflict also involved numerous other examples of when humanity steps not only well over the line, but into an area that can only be described. These are recreations and not real, by the way, chat. Described as heinous, and our story today is one such example. With a name like the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department, you might be forgiven for thinking that Japan's Unit 731, to use its informal name, was an admirable group fighting the good fight. But you couldn't be more wrong. To put it bluntly, the actions of this covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit, which regularly involved lethal human experimentation on males and females ranging in age from newborns to the elderly, were some of the darkest in a war filled with darkness. When we think of World War II, we I've literally never heard of this before. Dog, if you live in America, you don't hear about America's war crimes. Why the fuck would you hear about the Japanese war crimes that the Americans literally fucking hid? I mean, of course not. Of course not going to fucking hear about it, dude. What do you mean? We often simply focus our attention on the European theatre of conflict. If you ask your good friend Google when the Second World War began, you will invariably be shown the date 1st of September 1939, the date German tanks rumbled into Poland, sparking declarations of war by both Britain and France. If you're a European, I suppose that this makes perfect sense. However, by this point, a war had been raging thousands of miles away for quite some time. Yet even here, dates surrounding the beginning of the Asian side of the global conflict can be a little conflicting. The Japanese invaded Chinese Manchuria on the 18th of September 1931, but this was a much smaller operation than what was to come and saw the Japanese annex the area before setting up a puppet government. Six years later, however, the Second Sino-Japanese War erupted after the Marco Polo Bridge incident in which a Japanese soldier, Private Shimura Kikujiro, temporarily disappeared, giving the Japanese army the perfect excuse to cross the border to investigate. Private Kikujiro soon reappeared. Perhaps it was the worst timed toilet break in history, or maybe the Japanese fabricated the entire thing to find an excuse to start the war. Either way, a full military conflict was now underway, a full two years before Hitler's border-crossing escapades in Poland. The Second Sino-Japanese War and the Japanese occupation of mainland China saw brutality on a scale that rivaled the Nazis and sometimes even beat Herr Hitler into second place. The Battle of Shanghai, which began on the 13th of August 1937, was the first major conflict between the two sides and set a pattern that would be repeated countless times in the early stages of the war. The spirited Chinese defense, but ultimately a crushing victory by the Japanese. But this war soon took a dark turn with the events that occurred in and around the city of Nanjing in December 1937 and January 1938. The number of Chinese civilians that remained in Nanjing when the Japanese military overran the city has been debated ever since, with confusion over how many had already fled and just how many were now sheltering within the Nanking safety zone. A yeah, confusion on it from... Definitely confusion on it from the Japanese parties on, on, that, on that issue. But that is, of course, a tale as old as time itself. Um, a lot of people don't understand it because, like, they think, oh, you're Asian. You know what I mean? Like, you're all the same. Like, in the Western world... Because of proximity and because of white supremacy, we have this attitude, usually, that, like, Asian people are a monolith. Meanwhile, they've been fucking warring at a time when, like, most of the fucking Angloids were dying because they couldn't wipe their asses, you know what I mean? Like, their, their aggression towards one another goes back thousands of fucking years, and Orientalism as well. Yeah. 
literally, uh, and, and, and horrific as well. Like, people don't understand the resentment that Koreans uh, and, and Chinese people and Japanese people feel towards one another. <laughs> Here are five reasons why USA number one country is better than Europe. One, US make atom bomb. Two, we killed World War II. Three, we're only guns country. Three, we have 50 state and Europe none. Four, we are more richer than Europe. Five, Europe is worst country. Why is it resentment and not racism? Um, I don't know. Because it's like nationalistic resentment. That can be in certain instances racialized, but racism is... Racism and the way we understand it oftentimes is about... Uh, racism in the way that we talk about it and the way that we understand it in the Western world usually derives around uh, or is, is, is built upon the foundation of the one drop rule and a justification for chattel, uh, chattel slavery. So usually it's, uh, you know, white supremacist racism or xenophobic racism against like non-whites or what we decide is white. You know? But don't worry, you know, there is, they have racism too over there. When Chiwa was in Korea playing league, they thought it was a Chinese player, and they constantly say only good Chinese is a dead one. She was wild. It's like a different kind of racism. It's hard to describe with American uh, terms. It's like the Balkans. Yes, actually. Good take. It is kind of like the Balkans. And then there is the Americanized version of racism that you understand, and that's often a colonial holdover or an imperialistic holdover of like, like, I'll give you this example. For example, fair skin uh, in, in Chinese culture has also still historically meant better, right? There's colorism in China as well. And that colorism in China has existed uh, and, and certainly predates like any kind of Western involvement. Where does it come from? Well, it actually still comes from a classist perspective. Colorism in China implied that fair skin was better because that meant you stayed indoors, that you were not working uh, in the fields uh, as a rice farmer, right? That's what that implied. So that's why people uh, naturally, or not naturally, but people were socially conditioned to believing that fair skin was, was a good thing, okay? Okay. Um, in most of uh, Asian countries, a similar attitude existed. So that's where, that's, yeah, neat skin, exactly. That's where nobility, the understanding of nobility and, and colorism uh, first came from. But then Western imperialism would come in and take over pre-existing social and racial constructs and then, or rather, pre-existing social constructs built around fairness of skin and whatnot and be like, oh, we have that shit too. Let's go, baby. And basically kick it up to the fucking highest degree you can as a method of control. Because racial divisions or colorist divisions were yet another means of controlling a population and keeping them subservient because they were too busy fucking fighting amongst themselves. It is a very, very good, uh, a very effective colonial tactic. Like the caste system in India as well. Exactly. Exactly. A series of small areas, mainly encompassing foreign embassies, that rather ironically had been set up by a member of the Nazi party. While the number of how many killed during the Nanjing massacre can be debated, the lowest estimate seems to be 30,000 and the highest 300,000, the savagery of what occurred has long been clear. Mass murder and mass rape enveloped the city as Japanese soldiers indiscriminately tore through Nanjing. It provided one of the most horrifying episodes across the entire war. Holy but by this point, fuck. the Japanese had begun something arguably even worse. God damn, brother. Okay, this to is begin the story of Unit 731, we need to backtrack a little to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria 
1931. At that point, there was an army unit with the name Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory, which, as far as we know, began life as an innocent research and public health agency that dealt with protecting Japanese soldiers from chemical attacks on the battlefields. But this changed in 1932, when Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, Chief Medical Officer of the Imperial Japanese Navy, was placed in charge of this unit and formed a secret subgroup under the name Togo unit, perhaps after General Hideki Togo, the Japanese politician and general of the Imperial Japanese Army, who had received the bulk of the blame for starting the war with the United States. The Togo unit was tasked with investigating and developing biological and chemical warfare from the Zongma Fortress, a prison slash experimentation camp in Beini, a village 100 kilometers, that's 62 miles south of Harbin on the South Manchurian Railway. This was a tiny village of around 300 homes, which the Japanese burned to the ground before expelling the local population, leaving only a large building that subsequently became the headquarters of the Togo unit. Around the building, the Japanese constructed a prison camp that included a three meter high. Yes, I'll watch the Kyle Cullen see Jordan Peterson debate. Please shut the fuck up. Earthen wall. We're learning about fucking Japanese war crimes, okay? Shut the fuck up. You can thank Japan and the Brits for the bash crazy reactionary Chinese of today. Yo, Unit 731 killed 400,000 people. One actual fuck. I've never heard of this. First of all, no, that's, that's, there, he's, he's talking about the, the rape of Nanking, uh, and, and separately talking about Unit 731. Um, but also, the reason why you never heard about it is because America literally fucking absolved them and defended them and used their research. That's the reason why you didn't hear about it topped with electrified barbed wire and a moat with a drawbridge. Inside, numerous buildings- Oh, those are the actual Unit 731 numbers? Oh shit, okay, my bad. Things were erected, including housing units, barracks, and dining halls, but also laboratories, warehouses, and prison cells. This is all built with slave labor, mainly common criminals, captured bandits, anti-Japanese partisans, and political prisoners, all of whom were forced to wear blinders, like what you see on working horses, so they couldn't get a full idea of what was being constructed. Those involved in the construction of the most secretive buildings I don't were think it's real, but still, I'm not completed. making any. It had a capacity of a thousand, but it's thought that the prisoner population, who were referred to as logs because of the cover story that the site was a wood mill, usually hovered around 500 or 600. And here is where the horror begins. Once completed, the Japanese began rounding up prisoners, often criminals from the nearby area, mainly Chinese, but also a large number of Russian expatriates living in China. They were brought to the Zong. I got a PLB back. And south of Harbin. The following year, the Togo unit received a major shake-up and came under the direct jurisdiction of the Imperial Army. 731 experimented with dropping plague-infested fleas out of planes over dense Chinese cities. The amount of victims they cause can never be fully counted. Being divided into two, the Ishi unit and the Wakamatsu unit. Initially, together, they were known as the Epidemic Prevention Department, but from August 1940, it was referred to as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army, or Unit 731. At its largest, Unit 731, stationed in Pinfang, was composed of 300 researchers, including doctors and bacteriologists, who would sometimes publish their findings in peer-reviewed scientific journals, failing to mention that many of the experiments were done on humans and not monkeys, as was stated. But this was just one section of a much larger, grim web that eventually included around 10,000 people across numerous units stationed in Manchuria, but also elsewhere, including Unit 1855 in Beijing, Unit EI-1644 in Nanjing, Unit 8604 in Guangzhou, and later Unit 9420 in Singapore. The main location for Unit 731 was the site in Harbin, which measured 6 square kilometers, that's 2.3 square miles, and included more than 150 buildings, many of which were factories used to produce chemicals or biological agents, and the Harbin complex could produce 30 kilograms of bubonic plague bacteria in just a few days. It was said that it included around 4,500 containers used Trigger warning, horrific minor story from Nanjing that made headlines of fame in Japan of two officers holding a contest of who can kill 100 people fastest using a katana. Jesus fucking Christ, dude. To raise fleas, six enormous cauldrons to produce various chemicals, and around 1,800 large containers to produce biological agents. The typical life expectancy of 
prisoners in Unit 731 was about two months, though there were instances of some surviving for as long as 12 months, but these cases were often pregnant women who the Japanese wanted to give birth in order to investigate the effects of various diseases on the newborn child. And before we move on to talk about the experiments themselves, let's just be very clear about what kind of facility we're talking about here. Nobody who came through the gates as a prisoner ever left alive. The darkest actions carried out under the guise of Unit 731 came under the code name Maruta, meaning logs, and varied wildly. It's difficult to know where to start in this pit of absolute hell, so let's just get straight into it. Many of the early experiments focused on how the body reacts to certain diseases, and many prisoners were infected with syphilis, gonorrhea, and other venereal diseases. And that was just the start. While the Japanese were certainly interested in the visible external effects, it was often what was happening inside the body that they were really interested in. Vivisections, where the body is dissected for experimental purposes, was a common practice in Unit 731 on living humans, always without anesthetic and with a rag stuffed into the mouth of the poor soul going under the knife to muffle the screams. This was done so researchers could examine the effect of certain diseases on different bodily organs, but there has certainly been plenty of suggestion that at least some of the horror seen in Unit 731 was done so purely for sadistic pleasure. And it gets even weirder from here. Sometimes limbs would be amputated and reattached at different places on the body, or internal organs removed and then added back in, but in different locations. Other prisoners were subjected to chemical weapons. Those aren't real, by the way. Those reenactments, uh, or, you know, those, those aren't like actual real Testing imagery. Including mustard gas, leucite, cyanic acid gas, white phosphorus, atom site, and phosgene gas. Sometimes this was done in secure chambers, while well, there were widespread reports of large-scale experiments on the effects of mustard gas where prisoners were tied to posts outside. This was also done with plague, cholera, typhoid, and anthrax before it was taken to the next stage of testing, which was usually done on a live Chinese population, either through poisoned wells, aircraft drops, or fleas and other animals that had been infected with the disease. While the Japanese were eager to test the next generation of weapons that could kill thousands in one fell swoop, they didn't neglect the tried and tested. Prisoners were used to test new grenades, flame. By the way, for the record, in just like the same exact fucking uh, thing that uh, there's a similarity, almost a direct similarity between the testing that occurred in Unit 731, uh, like uh, uh, Mengele's uh, experiments as well, that um, were just cruel for the purpose of being cruel. And not only that, but also led to like zero new medical information coming out of it. Because they weren't like, they weren't conducting these experiments with the purpose of saving lives but we're conducting these experiments with the uh, purpose of finding new ways to kill. So because of that reason, a lot of this shit, like a lot of this shit didn't even lead to any kind of fucking, like it, it didn't lead to any kind of uh, a positive outcome as a consequence of this. Like you didn't actually find any uh, significant medical information. Throw isn't even bombs, which saw prisoners tied to posts at increasing distances from the explosion. Yo, JP was right. This is equivalent to consensual mastectomy. Yeah, remember when Jordan Peterson literally looked at well, not this, but uh, the the uh, Nazi experimentation and said consensual mastectomy is similar to it. Yeah, think about think about how fucked up Jordan Jordan Peterson is for saying something like that. Holy fuck! So that the damage radius could be measured. With new guns and bullets, wound patterns and penetration depths were carefully recorded, and the same was done with bayonets, knives, and swords. Experimentation regarding hypothermia was also a keen subject of interest in Unit 731, and typically involved limbs of prisoners being submerged in icy water until they were effectively frozen solid. Then researchers, or sadistic lunatics depending on how you want to call them, experimented to find the best way of heating the limb to return it to its normal state, sometimes using fire or boiling water, and sometimes simply leaving the poor wretch overnight to see what would happen. And yet, and I feel like I've said this already, that wasn't the worst of it. The Japanese also did extensive experimentation to find out how quickly the human body would suffer from hypothermia. And Didn't Unit 731 supposedly lead to secret risk discoveries? I remember a bunch of US generals giving the scientists amnesty for that reason, supposedly. No, motherfucker, they gave him amnesty because they wanted to use biological and chemical warfare against the Soviets. That's the reason why they did that. 
and then die of exposure. They introduced different variables, such as when the prisoner had last eaten, and what they had, and what they were wearing, and how much salt and protein they had in their body before the experiment. To perhaps sum up the whole- People say this kind of bullshit about the Nazis too. No, the Americans did that to the Nazis as well. So did the USSR. Yes. Horrifying actions of Unit 731 in one dreadful example. They found that a newborn- And the reason why we're talking about the Japanese war crimes, if you're like just tuning in and you're like, why the fuck are we talking about Japanese war crimes and shit during World War II? Um, Shinzo Abe is, is famous for- uh, if you ask, like, American liberals, he's famous for, you know, uniting the Indo-Pacific region against the Chinese threat and being America's greatest ally or whatever the fuck, right? But he's also famous for quite literally, uh, he's also famous for quite literally fucking uh, whitewashing all of those crimes. Um, so that's the reason why we started off on this subject matter, because we were, we were talking about his death and we were talking about his legacy and, and uh, you know, what that means... And I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, people had a better understanding of what his, like, uh, legacy looks like. Because a lot of people are unaware. And the similarities of his legacy to, um, the similarities of his legacy to, uh, you know, American uh, politicians who also have regularly uh, whitewashed war crimes. And he hasn't even whitewashed it yet. Archie 21 is correct. He also celebrated it as well. Yeah, I mean, he, he did this. This, by the way, is not an accident, for the record. 731 is an incredibly important number. 731, as a consequence of Unit 731, which we are looking at currently, is the, the equivalent of, yeah, you know, like the German Chancellor, as the tweet dictated, as the tweet showed earlier, uh, is the equivalent of, like, the German Chancellor, like, riding a tank that has 1488 on the side of it. So did he deserve the die? Um, I have no interest in, like, making a, a moral uh, take on his assassination. And I've made that very clear from the jump. There are definitely people who are like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm glad he's dead. I don't give a shit, uh, to be real with you. I, I, I literally don't care. He's dead, I don't give a shit. He's alive, I don't give a shit. Like, he was not a good person overall, though, and also um, his legacy will be celebrated and whitewashed by Western powers, because his purpose was to um, do exactly what uh, people in his family had done time and time again in Japan and in Japanese politics, which is serve the American and also capitalist interests and be a safeguard in, the, uh, in that region against the spread of communist influence. Look at, the different, look at the different treatment of John McCain. What do you mean? I fucking said way worse shit about John McCain. Why? Because at least John McCain is an American politician, so I have, like, more of a point of view on John McCain dying and, and resting in piss firmly and gently uh, than I do about uh, Shinzo Abe. I just don't... I don't care. To be fair, though, yes, John McCain is literally a better anti-imperialist hero than all of Chat combined. <coughs> John McCain is a better anti-imperialist American hero than all of Chat combined, considering how many military planes he downed in Vietnam. And I don't mean Vietnamese planes, of course. I mean American military planes, because he was a dog shit fucking fighter. And yet, as a consequence of being, uh, uh, as a consequence of coming from a long line of admirals, uh, he still kept failing upwards, and they still allowed him to fucking commandeer these goddamn things. And also, famously, he uh, dropped the last plane he would ever drop. Uh, on his way to like, what what was it, like bombing a fucking factory or some shit? You know what I mean? Like, or bombing yet another uh, uh, Vietnamese village. So, yeah. <laughs> John McCain bottom gun. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Baby will die in roughly three days if left unattended outside. And I know that that seems like a lot, but that's just scratching the surface. Other experiments include giving prisoners the wrong blood transfusion or the blood of animals, injections of seawater, the human body's tolerance for g-force using a rotating chamber, prolonged x-ray exposure, rape and forced pregnancy, and probably a whole lot more that we'll never completely know about. There were even horrific stories of bodies and body parts being pickled in formaldehyde, with the only labels visible being the nationality of whoever was inside. And we arrive at With why Japanese so many of you don't know. The end of World War II, there appears to have been high-level discussion regarding the use of chemical or biological weapons against the Allies and even on the U.S. mainland. This would be done using information and methods taken from the research done by Unit 731. 
It's impossible to say how close this actually came, though an attack codenamed Operation Cherry Blossom at night, which called for biological attack on Southern California, was certainly at some degree of planning when Japan surrendered in September 1945. As the war ended and Japan surveyed its destroyed country, Unit 731 was disbanded and its facilities in Manchuria and on the Japanese mainland were destroyed along with much of the information regarding what had happened there. Prisoners remaining in the camps after Japan's surrender were quickly executed and their bodies disposed of. But this was not something you could keep under wraps. When the Americans arrived in Japan, rumors of chemical and biological testing swirled. Not. But unless you're America, and you will try. Little to no information was openly given to the Americans, for obvious reasons. It was only when the threat of Soviet involvement, and no doubt vicious vengeance, came into play, that Japan's dark secrets surrounding Unit 731 were shared with the United States. A dossier detailing what occurred soon found its way to the desk of General Douglas MacArthur, the man tasked with rebuilding Japan and some- just, just understand, as we already covered this earlier, but like, this is a video version of that. But just fucking understand that, like, America looked at this and went, we can use this. We can use this, baby. Florida will remember Abe. Florida is shocked and saddened by the assassination of Shinzo Abe. And we sent our condolences to Shinzo's family and the nation of Japan. He was a great man, a great leader, and a great ally to the United States. Thank you, Ron DeSantis. You are my president. One day, inshallah. Big decisions needed to be made of the possible prosecutions. If there were ever war crimes committed, it was under the dark scope of Unit 731. However, the end of World War II saw an almost immediate pivot away from past enemies and towards new ones. For the Americans, the Japanese were no longer the enemy, and they would do whatever they could to make life hard for those devious Soviets. General MacArthur authorized blanket immunity for those who worked in Unit 731 in exchange for sole ownership of the information and findings which the United States deemed hugely valuable. In the Tokyo trials, which saw 28 Japanese military and political leaders tried for a variety of crimes, there was only a single solitary mention of chemical poisoning in occupied China and absolutely nothing about probably the worst macabre experimentation unit across the entire war. The Soviets weren't at all satisfied with this and instigated their own trials known as the Khabarovsk War Crimes Trial, which began in December 1949. A total of 12 men were convicted of war crimes and sentenced to between 2 and 25 years in Siberian labor camps. Now, you might be thinking, well, at least they got what they deserved, but, well, not really. Considering what happens in Unit 731, these sentences were extraordinarily lenient. And would you know it, most of those convicted soon found their way back to Japan, reportedly after handing over some of the secrets from Unit 731 to the Soviets. The United States refused to acknowledge the Karbovsk trials, labeling them as Soviet propaganda, but it's crystal clear that both the US and the Soviet Union let those responsible for the horror in Unit 731 off the hook for their own gain. What followed was decades of near silence in Japan, with successive governments denying all knowledge of the activities of Unit 731. But by the turn of the millennium, with more- Were people just that dumb back in the day that people saw this and were like, yeah, sounds right? Wait, what do you mean, dude? What are you talking about? People today, with the adequate knowledge, are still refusing to recognize this shit. What are you talking about back then? People just don't care, man. They don't give a fuck. It serves their purpose. It serves their interests. And there's plenty of propaganda to go around that will, like, defend it. Look at America right now. Look at all the shit that we're doing right now. Bro, we are not that far removed from, like, Abu Ghraib, okay? Like, that is a thing that we just did. We are not that far removed from George W. Bush's administration defending torture. Like, openly defending torture. We have Gitmo that's still in operation. The Supreme Court recently denied habeas corpus to people who have still yet to be released. No due process for, uh, for, for Muslim criminals that the, the military has decided to be uh, criminal. Yeah, America has constitution camps on the border and we have a torture camp in Cuba. And when I mention that, motherfuckers are like, bro, how dare you? I mean, you're going too far. It's like, no, it's the same shit, dumbass. You just refuse to recognize it. We have black sites all around the fucking planet. Speaking of domestic black sites, Chicago police had a black site where they would torture uh, suspects. So this shit happens. You can say I'm a fucking tanky. You can say like, oh, Hassan, you're just guided by anti-American sentiment. It's like, yeah, I do have anti-American sentiment because I'm fucking sane and not insane. 
Khan actively making his freedom of information packet delayed. Yeah, bro, I don't know what's going on. They they haven't gotten back to me at all. Black sites are where CIA operates in in any way they want to. <laughs> Wait, Hassan hates America. What the hell? What I'm beginning I'm beginning to think that this guy doesn't like America all too much. I love the potential of America. That's why I'm here. Okay, I love the the potential that America poses, except we have only used it against the world, okay? And I said the potential America poses because it's a threat. <laughs> America poses a threat. More and more people speaking out about it, including those who had worked there, it was only a matter of time. In August 2008, the Tokyo District Court ruled for the first time that Japan had engaged in biological warfare and directly named the work done by Unit 731. In 2018, after a request by Professor Katsuo Nishiyama of the Shiga University of Medical Science, the National Archives of Japan released the names of 3,607 members of Unit 731, all of whom had lived freely since the end of the war, and many of whom had since died. Apart from the 12 men who faced the ethically- Like, I love Japan. I'm fascinated with Japan. I love Japan. But nobody's like, bro, you're really being anti-Japanese right now when I'm covering Japanese fucking war crimes. You know what I mean? It's the same shit. Probably not a good time to say that. I'm just saying, I mean, I'm being honest. Like, shaky Soviet trial in 1949, absolutely nobody was ever held accountable for their actions at the unit. In fact, many of them went on to quite illustrious careers in post-war Japan. In 2002, at an international symposium on the crimes of bacteria, only two countries you can't criticize for their war crime, and they're both America. <laughs> right, baby. Cannot and should not ever, ever criticize the United States of America. How dare you? Logical warfare in China, the number of people deemed to have been killed through Japanese chemical and biological warfare programs was estimated at 580,000. And that includes those killed through attacks outside the walls of Unit 731, as well as those inside. It's impossible to know the true number of those killed by Unit 731, but it's thought that at least 3,000 men, women, and children were experimented on and killed in the Ping Fang site alone. This is not a place where anybody left alive. Everybody who walked through the gates died one way or the other. The vast majority of these were Chinese, but large numbers of Russians and Koreans also perished in the facilities, along with lesser numbers of Mongols, Americans, British, and French. I said right at the start of today's video that World War II delivered some sickening events and despicable cruelty, but the actions of Unit 731 were on a different level. This wasn't just blind torture, and most of the experiments came with very particular purposes that in some ways actually managed to further scientific understanding, both for peaceful and military means, which is why both the US and the Soviet Union were so eager to gain access to the information. This What? No, it was all fucking biological and chemical warfare uh, information. What? may have been done under the shadowy guise of scientific experimentation, but it was some of the most sadistic, cruel science that you're ever likely to see.